This uh, has been uh, a very interesting evening for me because one of the ways my wife and I um, coped with the diagnosis 20 years ago with Parkinson's, uh, we, well, first we went to a Parkinson's Society meeting and um, we, we got out of there really fast because you, you see a whole bunch of people with, who have had Parkinson's disease for many, many years and it's overwhelming. So we left and we said, that was, you know, we don't need to, we don't need to do that. And my wife actually was very, very much a creative, used denial in very creative ways. Uh, you know, the, the, in many ways, I watched and I saw her sort of bump into walls every once in a while. I don't mean physically, I mean psychologically. But on the other hand, she didn't, um, she didn't let it let it uh, dominate her, her her life in many in many ways, except emotionally. Unfortunately, she worried and worried and worried. So uh, one and when you know in the talks tonight. Uh, one of the points was that there were stages in caregiving and certainly um, as I look back now on it I can see that in the early stages there was very little physical caregiving involved. My wife could get around okay, she, she's able to drive herself to school and finish her, her career, but she needed a lot of emotional support and needed to be, you know, and it seemed to me, I, I was always a bit of a pragmatic person, I would say look, why imagine a disastrous future I'm not saying we should imagine a non-disaster future. Why don't you, we use a strategy of whatever happens, we'll deal with it. You know, we're pretty good at dealing with things, but we'll, so what we'll do it that way. And uh, uh, another thing was um, uh, being a mediator in terms of the relationship with our children as, as her uh, disability increased, it was confusing for the kids because they were adults by the time she really was starting to become involved with Parkinson's. We were very fortunate that we, we finished our career, we more or less finished our intensive parenting, our kids were gone and, and everything else were. Uh, so really, uh, you know, our relationship with the disease uh, has come at a time when uh, for many, many people, when you get the empty nest, you, you wind up being a new couple again. You wind up being a couple and going into your golden years um, it, it, with, a, with a, a redefined, if not revitalized, relationship. A lot of couples break up at that point because they decided they'd rather have another relationship <laughs> elsewhere. But, uh, but for couples who stay together, often when, they, when the, the kids leave home, it's the time to uh, rediscover your, or reinvent your, your own relationship. And so for us, that, that meant also having Parkinson's. So I think the emphasis on relationship that Bonnie placed on it was, I found very, very, uh, very, very interesting. I think the main thing that, of what I heard tonight, and it certainly um, it, it is reflected in my own experience, and uh, that is there is a unique and for I, I'm my wife is Parkinson's, so I'm speaking from that perspective. And Parkinson's is quite unique; it, it varies from person to person. So that although there are, are, are many characteristics simil similarities, um, there are also a lot of unique qualities. So I think the thing is the thing that I would um, repeat in what I've heard this evening is uh, to the importance of being honest about the, the whole thing. Uh, another thing I'll, I'll just mention is um, I, I worked in uh, elementary education, and special education mostly, so I worked with a lot of women and, uh, so, and most of my best friends are, are women. Uh, and, and tonight I was hearing something that that was not an issue for me, but I think it must be an issue more commonly for, for women, and that is the expectation of, of caregiving. Um, I've had more sympathy from friends as the caregiver sometimes than my wife gets as the person with the problem. They say, how are you doing? Um, we're making supper and we're bringing it over to your house today. So, well, this isn't, isn't that nice? Um, so I find that kind of I find it kind of interesting. Not to say that that I don't share some of the conflicts about respite and feeling guilty about it and whatnot. There are certain things I say. Well, I couldn't possibly live if I if I thought I would never travel again. I, I managed to keep my wife traveling right up until it was impossible for her to really do it anymore. It was more painful than not. 
And so it wasn't worth it. We, we traveled more in working situations. We worked in Bosnia with teachers and we were in China for a while and, so, and in Switzerland. So there were a lot of times we went and we worked and it was getting harder and harder for her to, to do that. But, uh, you know, I, I thought it was important to, to stay, for her to stay involved. And since then, I've, I've, I've done traveling just for fun with my, one of my sons. We went to Florence for a week. I still can't imagine not traveling, although, <coughs> It's harder and harder for her now. Now at this stage, she's, she's starting to have more cognitive di difficulties. And it is hard for me to see her suffering, even though I know when she goes to the, to the uh, Rito Pearly, she does fine and she also, you know, re-engages with her own resourcefulness. You know, she has to remember how to get back from the cafeteria or something like that. And that's actually, that's actually uh, good for her. So that's a, uh, um, so again, I think the important thing is that the people have to realize that there's a bit of personal discovery and there is no, you, you've got to learn how to do it and, and not give in to what it should look like. And I think this is the part where women, uh, maybe uh, there's more social pressure on women that there's a right way to be a wife, there's a right way to be a mother, and there's a right way to, to do that, that sort of thing. Whereas for me, uh, you know, like I have to do the laundry, I'm going to do it my way, you know, and uh, uh, if I got to do the cooking, look, I'm making the meals, don't tell us what we're going to eat, okay? You're going to eat what I serve you, that's the way it is. I mean, I've had to, you know, go get around that. I tried serving these prepared frozen meals, not, not the Stouffer's ones, but there's a, there are places where they make, make meals and freeze them and stuff. And I would say, oh, this is getting a little repetitive. Yeah, <laughs> well, if it, uh, that means I have to go shopping, do all groceries, and then plan the meals, and then do the cooking, and clean up the kitchen, you know, we can eat some repetitive meals every once in a while. But anyway, I think it's interesting. I think for, for, I saw that even in, in my career. I remember one time uh, a colleague of mine, a uh, woman, had to rush home. We were both doing the same evening course, and she had to rush home and make supper for her husband and her children and then go back to the university and she wouldn't even eat any of the supper. I said, well, why are you doing that? She says, well, I have to go home and do that. Why do you, you mean, you, you, you mean your husband and your children can't possibly put a meal together without you? I thought, that's, that's very interesting. So I think, you know, as an, just a, as an observer here, I, I, I think it must be a little bit more complicated caregiving for a woman than, than for a man. And maybe that's a generalization that's not, you know, shouldn't even be taken too too strongly. I remember when I was a young father and I had one of my sons, I was I was a house husband for a year because I was doing courses at night, my wife was teaching, and I took my son to a, a play group in Sandy Hill where we were living at the time, and I said uh, something about, you know, women being, you know, naturally being more loving towards their children. One young mother said, how do you know that? How do you know it's just as hard for me? How do you know it's not just as hard for me to take care of my two-year-old as it is for you? I thought, that's interesting. You know, and again, the, the, the expectations on women to, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tough one. So um, uh, in conclusion, uh, on behalf of the Parkinson Society and the, particularly the caregivers uh, group that meets uh, to, to give each other support, and that's something I would definitely say is important I would I should have gotten involved with it sooner than I did you know I, that my wife didn't get involved with the Parkinson's herself society uh, I should have gotten involved I think it would have been I think it would have been easier for me to, to not have to discover all of these these things that, I, that I've heard tonight although part of it I'm not sure you can get away from it I, I think you gotta you do there's an awful lot in life you have to kind of learn learn firsthand and uh, I think that what some of the best advice we got tonight was to uh, uh, you know to reach out <coughs> and not be alone in that process I think it's the being in the, in the, the being alone part of it that's probably the most difficult and that's going to bring you to the brink of uh, you're going to if you need help you're going to get it whether you ask for it consciously or ask for it unconsciously which means get sick and have somebody else take responsibility for something that that really if you could see it coming, you gotta, you gotta do something about it. So on behalf of the uh, Parkinson's Society, I'd like to thank the, the MS uh, Society for uh, including us in this, in this evening tonight and for bringing in these guest speakers who uh, you know, ha you know, has, have given us uh, tools to sort of 
see our, our experiences in perspective and to shape it and, and maybe to realize that uh, uh, you know these human emotions that we all have are very very common and that if we don't talk about them with other people they just influence us in ways that uh, we're not aware of so I think that's the main thing is uh, is sharing the experience and communicating about it not not feeling guilty uh, it's not easy at all but you know my my old my, one of my adult sons is having some medical problems of his own he's 40 years old and he says you know and he's like gee you know this doesn't seem fair <laughs> I said life's not fair what makes what, what gave you the impression that life was going to be fair uh, you know I mean it's a it's it, it, it kind of a, a uh, as children, you know, we, we say, well, it's, they, they lose their childhood innocence. What does that mean? They mean they realize, they realize life is really tough. You know, even when you're a kid, life ain't easy, you know. Uh, as an elementary school teacher, we have this romanticized vision of our happy childhood. Well, oh, children aren't any happier than adults are. They're, they're more, they're more uh, demonstrative about when they're happy and when they're not happy. But, you know, life is tough for them, too. Life is tough for all human beings. That's the human, the human condition. So uh, I, I, I thank uh, people who, who have brought a professionalism to this experience and who are studying it because in fact I found that there was a tremendous amount of support or, and people, you know, the CCA, people from the CCAC, when they came and did an assessment and, and I said, well, you see, we're pretty independent. We don't really need somebody coming in. And, and the person said, no, nah, I don't see that, you know, and we got two hours a day. And I realized, and she said, you know, some of this is for that kind of respite. So I go to the gym. I mean, I can get to the gym and leave my wife for an hour anyway, but now I can stop and read the paper and have a coffee and really have that break. And my wife says, but I don't have anything for her to do. I said, part of the reason she's coming here is so that I can go. So play cards, watch TV. It's not important. You don't have to give her things to do. You know, just uh, she's going to take care of you while I'm gone. And, and I think that uh, the fact that the, my our caseworker was aware of that long before I was, long before I saw that, she saw that. So, so anyhow, so on behalf of the, the Parkinson Society, thank you very much, uh, Bonnie Schroeder. And I've, I've seen her program on, on Rogers. It was, it was very, very entertaining. And uh, I would recommend that you see it. So uh, uh, on behalf of, of both societies tonight, I want to thank you for coming in. And, and, and uh, also your, your talk as well. I, I thought that was a, a fantastically, fantastic, short, but very accurate uh, way of looking at, you know, especially that relentless. It is relentless, you know. It is relentless. And, and I must say there are times, some of my favorite things right now is going on a website and looking at vacation spaces, not going there or planning, <laughs> just looking at uh, <laughs> you know, So that's the creative use of our, our, of our human uh, faculty. So, so thank you very much for coming.